Rudyard Kipling, British man, writes this poem, The White Man's Burden. And he's mostly referring to the British. The British are expanding overseas, they're creating an empire, uh, and they're taking over lands in Africa and Asia and the whole North American continent. And he's looking at this idea of really why is Britain expanding? really touches on this idea of the white man's burden, of this idea that the, the white people, the British, have this task and duty to bring civilization to the rest of the world. And certainly, while he is British and he's referring to the British Empire, this idea of uh, a duty really spreads to America. And it influences this idea that the United States needs to expand beyond the shores of North America uh, and look beyond to other places to spread its influence. And so this video is really looking at why the U.S. expands. And certainly there's a lot of reasons when it comes to politics. There's a lot of reasons that come to economics. But really we want to look at the philosophies of this expansion because all of these moments of war, of uh, trade, they all have a basis in some sort of philosophy. There's an idea behind an action. So before we even look at the actions of imperialism, we want to look at what drives them uh, for the ideas. The first of which is manifest destiny. Now, manifest destiny is a pretty old idea. It originates in the 1830s, 1840s, and Americans start seeing the rest of this continent. Remember, in the early 1800s, the U.S. population is mostly uh, on the East Coast. And people start viewing the rest of the continent. Lewis and Clark explore. They see all this open land. Uh, they do mention that there's a lot of Native American tribes. But Americans start seeing it as their God-given right to expand to the rest of the country. And they do. Uh, if you look at this image, you have these trains, uh, you have these covered wagons, people are settling in the bottom right, they're plowing the land. They also show the buffalo being chased away uh, and Native Americans being also chased away. So even the physical landscape, the people that are there, nothing can stop Americans from what they see as their right, their destiny. That America will span uh, from the Pacific to the Atlantic. But the territory is now closed. The West is, this mythical frontier is over. And uh, what this means is that this manifest destiny isn't done. Americans start seeing their destiny as perhaps lying outside of North America that they've expanded this much, why not expand more? So this idea of expansion is a pretty important force, not just for politicians, but for the average American, uh, that their greatness is tied to the land. And you can only keep being great if you keep expanding. Another pretty powerful idea comes from Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin has looked at uh, evolution. He's explaining this idea of the survival of the fittest. Uh, people like Carnegie latch on to that, ex use that to explain why they've made so much money. Uh, but people are also looking at this idea of social Darwinism when it comes to expansion. In particular, they're looking at this idea uh, or creating an idea that for the human race to advance, to progress forward, you're going to have conflict between a variety of social groups. And Whoever wins those conflicts are going to be the ones that help advance human culture and human civilization. Um, because the inferior groups are just holding back the human race. Um, now, Darwin was not looking at human groups, to be clear. Um, nor is there any scientific evidence that one society of humans is more advanced than another society of humans. Certainly some groups have better technology, uh, but it isn't like from birth, one group is better than the other. Uh, granted, if you have that opinion, that's called racism, um, because 
this idea of uh, a group of people being better to be superior than another group of people is simply racism. Um, so social Darwinism and racism go hand in hand. If you look at this image here, you have uh, good old Uncle Sam teaching a classroom. In the front of the room, you have these kind of grumpy and maybe rambunctious children uh, who are Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, which we'll get into. The U.S. takes over all of them. Um, in the back and by the door, you have a Native American who is reading upside down, not even allowed into the school. Uh, is It looks like a pretty racist image of a Chinese child. Uh, in the back left, we have a uh, also a very racist depiction of an African cleaning the windows, not even allowed near a book. Uh, and then, of course, we have our studious white children. So you have this idea that uh, throughout the world, you have groups of people that some of them are perhaps capable of being educated. Others are not even going to be giving them a chance. Um, so Americans are looking out, white Americans are looking out, and they're seeing different groups around the world. And they're being driven by Darwin and this idea that Americans are superior uh, to those elsewhere. So when conflict does arise, or issues do arise with various uh, ethnicities throughout the world, it helps to uh, justify conflict with them when you believe that, according to science, your group should be winning. And not only should your race be winning, but America should be winning. And after the revolution, this belief of American exceptionalism becomes a pretty important idea. And it's so important that to this day, this is one of the driving factors of American foreign policy in the planet. And it's this idea of American exceptionalism, that the United States was formed to be a democracy, to be a place of freedom. And compared to everywhere else in the world, it is exceptional that there was no place like this on the planet, which to be fair is true. Um, but because there was no place like this, it is now America's duty to spread those ideas of democracy and freedom. To prevent these dictators, these kings and queens and monarchs uh, from ruling people in a way that is seen as inferior, that's seen as uh, the, a, a worse way of government. And certainly a lot of these have a lot of problems, uh, which is why democracy is pretty great. Um, but it helps justify the United States when it comes to conflict um, that, well, those people don't know any better. We must show them this way of democracy and freedom. So even if people are resisting, saying, hey, hold on, we actually kind of like our way of government, the Americans say, oh, no, you just don't know enough. You don't know any better. We are going to show you what true freedom is like. So uh, as we'll get into all these conflicts that start happening, uh, these issues that start arising, this idea that America is exceptional, that is, uh, it's better than anyone else in the world, uh, it really helps convince a lot of people why we should get involved elsewhere in the world. And the final thing we're going to look at is this idea of Christianity. It's not an idea, it's a religion. It's the largest religion on the planet. And one of the reasons it's the largest religions on the planet is missionaries. You have people that are moving throughout the world, preaching uh, Christianity. They're teaching people both to read the Bible. Uh, they're creating schools. Uh, but they're spreading this, uh, this belief of Christianity throughout the planet. And a lot of Americans start to get into this missionary uh, business, this missionary calling. Uh, during the progressive era, during the progressive era, you have a lot of, especially women seeing this idea of social gospel, that their, their salvation, that their, uh, eternal soul is really tied to helping people. And you have people like Jane Addams who creates the Hull house and they do a lot of good in the United States. Do they do a lot of good around the world? Um, uh, and it's all driven by religion that, to really become, to show that you're a good person, 
uh, you must help people. So Americans start to get exposure to other cultures around the world through these missionaries. Um, and it's really, in some places, the first Americans that even get there. It has nothing to do with the military. Uh, you have Americans getting there because they want to preach. Usually they follow trading. Um, but this idea that there's all these savages around the world that are worshiping other religions, they have many gods, uh, closely tied into that racist idea. But the exposure to these other cultures, uh, the idea that perhaps we can help them, not only with their government, uh, not only can we help them maybe learn more, but we can bring them a true religion of Christianity. It does drive a lot of Americans of really getting on board with imperialism, getting on board with expanding America beyond its borders. Because in the long run, it's going to help people around the world. So we'll see the practical application of all these philosophies. We'll look at uh, 